Update. Would I be the a-hole if I told my male 46 kids, male 16 and female 18, their recently deceased mother, female 44, cheated on me? Original post. The wound's still a bit fresh. A month ago, my wife of 22 years tragically died in a car crash. Cynthia was one of those drivers that loved to stare into her phone, and unfortunately this bad habit caught up with her in the last week of January. I was pretty devastated when the police showed up at my door and told me she had a fatal accident, and I wanted to honor her somehow. At the time of the accident, I had no idea she was having an affair. The last four or five months, I did notice she was pulling away and our intimacy decreased, but I thought this was just something that happened to couples after 20 years, so I didn't pay much mind to it. But at least from what she told me, Cynthia started to get into writing. She was constantly on her laptop, typing away at all hours. She told me she was working on a fantasy book, hopefully the first of his series. When I asked more, she said it was about a fantasy world where a super-advanced human race appears and interacts with orcs and elves and magic with laser guns and high tech. It sounded very cool, and Cynthia promised as soon as she had her first draft she liked, she would let me read it. I decided to honor her by getting the draft of her book and hiring a writer to clean it up and publish it with a novelty press. I got on her laptop and… no book. No sign at all. I opened her Chrome thinking she might have written it in Google Drive and saw a bunch of pinned tab. One was a Facebook Messenger tab with a ton of her messages with a man named John. I have no idea who John is, never met him, but they talked about meeting up, exchanged photos, everything. The last message John sent her was two days before Cynthia's accident. The two saying they loved each other and him saying he was going on a business trip to Germany. The messages between Cynthia and John have shown they had met up at a house more than once, so I already had a lock changed. Not sure if John is back yet, and frankly don't care if he is. I was thoroughly devastated. She did have a Google Drive tab, but in her drive wasn't a book about elves versus Vulcans, but a shared document with John. The document was a plan her and John drafted in how to divorce me, turn the kids against me and take our home and as much money as possible. One thing she noted was she has been taking money, a few hundred a month, and putting it in a separate account. I got the bank things hoarded out, and the money in the kids' college account. I've also been going to therapy twice a week now. It is hard to be mad at someone dead, especially someone everyone else in your life is grieving and praising as a wonderful wife and mother. I've asked my therapist if I should tell my kids about what Cynthia has done and what she has planning to do. My therapist cautioned me about this. He said that they just lost their mother, and being told this would be condemning her memory. Damnatio memoriae. Maybe now it is not the time, but I think eventually would be a time for my kids to know. Now for the top comments before reading the update. Now is definitely not the time to burden them with that. I agree. As someone who lost a parent when I was growing up, I could not handle information like that at a time. I know every kid is different, so you know yours the best. But personally, I think it'd be easier to wait until they're independent adults, not just legal adults, because I did not consider myself to be functioning as an adult at 18, and can process everything without it taking a toll on their mental health during a time of grief. Yeah, like waiting until they're steady in their careers. I read something a long time ago, when one parent told the kids when one just finished high school and the other was in college. It broke them. The college student dropped out, and I can't even remember what happened to the 18-year-old. Maybe only tell them if they are experiencing something similar in their lives, so they can see that you understand what they are going through. Honestly, there is no need to tell them. My kids were grown and still had daddy on a pedestal. I told them eventually that he might have been a good dad, but he wasn't a good husband. They got it. They were four and five when he died, and twenty-something when I said that. They quit comparing their stepdad so harshly. This is literally all you need to say that you mourn him differently because he was different with you than he was with them. My mom has told me some things about my late father recently and it's hard to take. Plus, there's nothing to be done about it now. It just makes me feel bad that I didn't know what was going on at a time, even though I was a kid. She was the adult who chose to not take action. I will absolutely take some things to my grave unless my daughters find a way to get it out of me in my deathbed. I can tell they really don't want to know all of it. No one knows all of it. They don't need to know all of it. Adults should not be telling children everything that goes on in adult relationships. Full stop. But later it's a coin toss whether to tell adult children about such things. I don't think it's helpful unless for a very good reason. 
For example, my ex is bipolar. That's the most genetically determined of the major mental illnesses, and some of his story is relevant. Although, the children have now passed the point where bipolar makes its appearance, so it's a bit easier to discuss. You would be the a-hole, but I would suggest finding out who this John is and make sure he does not show up in your lives, such as at the funeral or anything. Sounds like they had some big plans involving your kids, and who knows what this POS could say. Now for the update. Some things have happened since the last time. To answer some questions, I have gone to the bank and got control of Cynthia's account and transferred the money into a savings account for the kids. Also, my kids already suspected. Tuesday night, my eldest Michelle and my son Jason had something to say to me. They sat me down in the living room and Michelle said, We think mom was cheating on you. They both said they weren't sure but it was eating them up seeing me in extreme grief the past month and they thought I should hear what they suspected. They brought up how Cynthia was always away and when she was at home, she would say strange observations about me. Stuff like, isn't it weird your dad's working late this week? This is one of those seeds Cynthia mentioned in her document that she wanted to plant to the kids. Michelle said her suspicions went high the week before the accident, when she got home from the school and saw a strange jacket on a coat hook by the front door. It wasn't any jacket Jason or I had, so she was very suspicious about it. I told both my kids that I didn't tell them but I found evidence on their mom's computer when I was looking for the book she said she was writing. Michelle wanted to see the evidence but Jason said he doesn't want to think or talk about mom for a while. I shared the info with Michelle after she insisted she already suspected her mom and was ready for it. It feels good to now have someone close that can talk to me about this beyond my therapist. Yesterday afternoon, I was home alone when I heard someone jiggling the back door snub. I went to the door and saw a man I never saw before, trying to use a key on the lock. I told him to step back from the door and he almost jumped. I opened the door a crack and asked him who he was and what he was doing in my backyard. It was John, Cynthia's affair partner. He told me that he worked with my wife, and he just got back from a trip and saw Cynthia died on social media, and him and Cynthia were starting a business. They had a business bank account with his investment money in the business, and he was wondering if I could help him get the business funds transferred over. I looked him straight in the eye and said I was at the bank, and Cynthia didn't have an extra business account, and I had no idea what he was talking about. John also said that he wanted to check my wife's things for any sensitive business documents. I said it was a stranger and wasn't welcome in my home, especially since he tried to enter without permission. John looked defeated, but did suggest he would consult with a lawyer about his sensitive business documents and business funds. John had a key to your home. And he knew Cynthia was dead, and still tried to enter like he had rights to it. Hope he needs to consult his own lawyer and get the locks changed. Change the locks if you haven't already. Very sorry about this. Glad your kids suspected and are handling it. Good luck to you all. That man is fortunate. By stealing into someone else's house, he was taking a risk that would cost him far more than money. I'm not proud about what I'm going to say, but if all of this is true, I'm glad she's dead. I mean, she wasn't only cheating, which is horrible. She was stealing Opie's money and executing a plan to put their own children against him. She was the incarnation of evil. Even all the pain, OP is lucky that this happened, because if not, she was prepared to take everything from him and destroy him. Her children saw something was wrong long ago. She was one of those people who believe their plan is immaculate because they are geniuses and completely underestimate everyone else. Most criminals think this way. Totally agree, the world is better without that kind of people. I get the feeling that business money was the money she was stashing away. If everything was in her name, he had no claim and couldn't sue a dead person. A silver lining here though, if she was still alive, I doubt the kids would have believed her lies about UOB. I would say get a security system for your house and maybe look into a PI to find out who this man is. He could be a dangerous person. Next story. Am I the a-hole for tricking my ex-wife during our divorce? My ex-wife, Becca, is 7 years older than me and has retired after 35 years of teaching. We had our kids later in life, and she took 4 years off to stay at home with them. I'm 58 now, and my ex decided 10 years ago that I wasn't who she wanted in her life anymore. It was a fairly peaceful divorce. Our kids were both in university, and we had that taken care of. The only real sticking point was our home. 
I thought we should sell the house, and each used the money to buy something smaller and that would require much less maintenance. It is a five-bedroom, four-bathroom house we bought after we got married. We got it at a very good price, and it has appreciated quite nicely over the last 38 years. Becca wanted to keep the house so the kids could keep their rooms, and so she had space for our, at that time, non-existent grandkids. Myself, our kids, our lawyers, everyone told her that it was a bad idea. I gave in and traded away alimony for my share of the house. Like I said, my kids were in school and neither of them planned on their careers keeping them in our town. My work gives me $250 a day tax-free as a living allowance since I work away from home. Rather than stay in a hotel, I've been renting a house in the city where I work. It works out well since I'm saving on travel back and forth. I see my kids when they have time. I took extra time off when my first grandchild was born. I can afford to do a lot of stuff I skipped before because I was saving for two people in retirement. Now that it's just me, I'm doing quite well. Becca is not. She wanted the lifestyle I was funding to continue. She went through her savings and now she just has her pension, which is pretty good I think, but it isn't enough to pay the property taxes, as well as pay for her trips, maintenance and stuff. She's having to sell her house where neither kid ever returned to live in after graduation. She has to travel to see our grandchild since my daughter is just at the beginning of her career and cannot take that much time off. She has been complaining to anyone who will listen that I'm living high on a hog and she was going to be homeless. That isn't true. There will be a bit of capital gains tax, but she will have an amount that will let her buy a condo for herself that is affordable. If she wants to keep the house, she could do a reverse mortgage, but I think that's a terrible idea. I think part of it is that I have a girlfriend now who is in her mid-30s, and she never found a guy she thought would be better than me. I think the guy she was seeing after we broke up was supposed to be him, but he didn't work out. She is mad that because of how I get paid, her alimony seemed like not a lot compared to owning a house free and clear, but I don't think it's my fault she wouldn't listen. Now for the top comments. Not the a-hole. I don't understand how she thinks you tricked her. I'm sure after that many years of marriage, she understood how you got paid. You need that money for a separate household so she doesn't get any of that. She was informed by everyone else that she should not keep the big house, but she would not listen. She kept up her lifestyle after the divorce even though she had much less income. She knew her kids were not planning on moving home. There is nothing here that makes you the bad guy. She has buyer's remorse, and that is not your fault. I think so too. I do feel bad that she feels this way, but I thought maybe I was missing something and you guys could point it out. Real estate is still priced pretty high. She should make some good money on a house, no? She absolutely will. If they divorced 10 years ago, all houses everywhere, assuming she didn't let it fall into disrepair, have since gone way the heck up. There's no way she doesn't still walk away without a massive payday. Heck, even if it was in disrepair, there's a house near me that caught in fire and is unlivable and the owners want 200k. Not the a-hole. She made a bad decision and is mad that you are living your best life. She has no one to blame for her choices than herself. Thank you. I thought maybe I was missing something obvious. I did honestly try to get her to sell the house during the divorce. It's not her fault that she has champagne tastes on a beer budget. And owning a home you can't afford is simple math she could have done and figured out. Stop dwelling on her issues and live your life. Right? She's certainly living rent-free in his head. It's hard to separate lives after almost 30 years together. Our friends and family are all the same after this long. She didn't seem to have much of a problem separating things. Last story. Am I the a-hole for completely ignoring Valentine's Day because of our dad bedroom and not entertaining my wife when she expressed that it upset her? My wife and I are in our early 30s and have a dad bedroom. She's lost her libido over the years, and I can positively confirm that this isn't a person I agreed to marry in the first place. I tried to get her help, but she hardly follows through on a suggested course of actions, whether it be in a couple's therapy or individual ones. I feel like I don't love her anymore, but in my culture, divorce is taboo. So I am essentially stuck in this marriage. I hate how she doesn't even try. She would have all the time in the world to complain about her manager or complain about her weight, but wouldn't do anything about it. But trying to improve intimacy and getting her to do stuff is like beating a dead horse. So I withdrew. It started by stopping texting her I love you beautiful every day when I'm at work. 
and then it stopped giving her foot rubs and back rubs. Stopped making date plans. Then it came to a head when I completely ignored Valentine's Day and didn't get her anything. It was just like any other day to me. She confronted me and was terribly upset about this. I asked her, has she done anything to make me want to love her? Why should I be coerced into giving affections I don't want to give? Like, why should I care about what she wants when that care isn't reciprocated? Maybe this is vindictive, but I am disillusioned by her and disappointed in her for giving up completely on an intimate part of our relationship. We cannot stand each other, and she doesn't acknowledge me. Am I the a-hole? Not the a-hole, but you're the a-hole to yourself. You're going to be miserable for the rest of your life because divorce is taboo? Nah, man, don't throw your life away. Be brave and let each other go. You should be more upset with your culture because divorce being taboo is ridiculous. Stay miserable if it's so important not to offend your culture. Otherwise, leave. She's an a-hole. Like in India, where divorce is a taboo, getting it is extremely hard. Especially as a man, where it's ridiculously and unbelievably common to use multiple DV and dowry sections as false cases to prevent it. If other party doesn't agree for a divorce. That too with an extremely slow and cruel court system. Getting divorce is so painful that most people suffer endlessly instead of getting it, especially men. Not the a-hole. And taboo or not, do you want to spend the rest of your life miserable because of a cultural taboo? Till death do us part? Sounds like person you married died already. Yeah, early 30s is perfect time to make a new start and build the life you want. Don't let cultural pressures get in the way of your happiness.